right, this is our last morning in John chapter 13. Let's turn there, and as I did last week, I'm only going to read that one central section. That's the, se- the section that's informing this sub series. John 13 and 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. May the Lord bless this reading of his word in our hearing. Well, roughly 25 years or so after the events that are recorded for us in John 13, though the Gospel of John was still decades away, at least in its written form, Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian Christians in which he said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, As you know, there are a number of important, world-changing covenants in Israel's story. But to date, that is, before Jesus' appearance in the world, there had only been one new covenant called that just once by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant. I will actually cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And if we were to read on in that passage, we would see quickly that Jeremiah's new covenant is set over and against the covenant that Yahweh made at Mount Sinai. What he calls my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. And you'll recall that covenant when it was made. It was attended by roughly the equivalent of 1,000 Fourth of July fireworks events. This was the appropriate setting for the Ten Words, as they are called in the Bible, what we call the Ten Commandments, written with God's own finger. Cecil B. DeMille made two versions of the Ten Commandments. One was silent, I think. It was made in the 20s anyway. But the second version is the one that we all watched growing up, ABC would always play it on a Sunday night because it fell right around both Passover and Easter. So it was a guaranteed ecumenical audience. And I remember the scene. There's this, the scene where the ten words are written by the finger of God. And there is a flaming whirlwind on the top of the mountain. And every so many seconds, there's this whipping blast a fireball that slams into the stone and sparks and burning. And what's left after, well, after the smoke settles 
is one of those ten words, the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. So when we recall the glory storm surrounding the first covenant, the lightning and the thunder and the earthquakes and the cloud and the fire, we might have expected something even grander to surround the cutting, the making of the new covenant. I mean, when we think about what the new covenant represents in redemptive history and how the old covenant pales in comparison, surely this is worth a trip to Mount Everest and maybe a few nuclear explosions to attend it. Instead, the event is a modest and mostly anonymous one. There are not 10,000 times 10,000 present to witness it. Just, I don't know, 11 or 12 men as far as we know. We're not even sure when exactly in the supper Judas left. So we come to the stipulation, the, the single word, if you will, of this new covenant in John 13, 34 through 35. And we might ask, well, what would DeMille have to do with this? What has he got to work with here? No whirlwind of fire hurling balls of flame at the side of a mountain. Just a man talking and very briefly slipping in what he calls a new commandment. And if any of them were distracted for a moment because they were still thinking about Jesus' departure, that person might have missed it entirely. You know how you in a meeting and you suddenly start looking out the window and you realize the person conducting the meeting has just said something and you didn't follow it? So maybe there's, I don't know, poor Peter. Sorry, can, can you... Can you say that again? You're giving us a new what? The event's simplicity may end up distracting us from the event's significance. In the same way that Jesus is announcing the new covenant in his own blood, so he is announcing the new commandment which, of course, will be in its own way represented by his own blood. But in a simple context, no fanfare, the press weren't called in, no photo op here. It doesn't line up with our expectations. And of course, this is part of the theology of the cross where modesty, even anonymity, and suffering are the ways that the gospel makes its progress in the world. And besides, who doesn't like fireworks? Well, I've had enough of them myself, but we still have to go out and see them every July 4th. And we recognize that it is July 4th, a very significant anniversary in American history and we save our fireworks for those memorable occasions so that we can commemorate important events. But by comparison, Jesus barely whispers out the words, the new covenant, and the single moral stipulation that rules them all when he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. And if our ears are primed so that we will only listen to explosions and shouts, we may end up missing it completely. And that brings my, me to my first point this morning. Jesus' new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. 
Jesus' new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. Now, I'm not the Presbyterian preacher that I was in my younger years, the angry Protestant who trolls the Pope every once in a while. But I found an article just yesterday, I think two days ago, that intersects almost perfectly with this sub-series. And what it turned out to be is another classic papal photo op. Here's the headline. Pope Francis washes the feet of a dozen inmates at a Roman prison in a ceremony. It was to commemorate Maundy Thursday. And here's the text. Pope Francis washed the feet of a dozen inmates at a prison near Rome in a Holy Thursday ritual that symbolizes humility. I stress the word symbolizes. It symbolizes humility and service and highlights his papacy's attention to those on society's margins. Okay, now I'm putting up in the corner of the screen a little SN. That's snark alert. There's an M before it. It's a mild snark alert. But this is actually a quotation from the article. He arrived in a motorcade that included Italian police cars at the prison. The ritual was closed to the public for security reasons and to protect the privacy of the inmates. So you can see how this symbolizes humility and service and highlights his papacy's attention to those on society's margin as long as he has a security detail and a police escort. Yeah. And it does symbolize humility. It symbolizes humility, but it's not the real thing. It even, if you read the article, it even has a close-up, I'm not making this up, of the Pope kissing a foot. And I'm thinking, that's not your best side. They should have shot it from this side. The Vatican, and I quote, said the Pope performed the foot washing following Jesus' example, quote, in a sign of love inspired by love, aimed at service and humility. And I don't think I'm adding too much to the story to say once it was over, he was whisked away back to the palace at the Vatican. Okay, so to state the obvious, Jesus didn't wash pre-selected prisoners' feet surrounded by a security detail. He washed his disciples' feet, the ones that he loved, the ones that he loved until the end, the ones that we will see further on, whom the Father had given to him, not one of which he had lost. And this is the example that he has given us, that we also should do just as he has done to us. This is the essence of the new commandment. In order that you love one another just as I loved you. It's not a yearly ritual to wheel out to show that the church is concerned with the marginalized. It's what disciples do for disciples. And if we never washed anyone's feet again, there are still 10,000 ways to keep this new commandment of the new covenant. It is a positive commandment. It's a positive commandment that prescribes, that requires something. The Decalogue's commandments are all negative. They are commands that proscribe. Well, most of them are anyway. But this positive prescribing commandment is built on maybe the most remarkable words ever uttered. 
Kathos Egapesa Humas. Just as I loved you. The command's power is the power of example, of a model to imitate, of a pattern to follow. Whenever we watch someone that we admire, we just intuitively want, we, we make it a purpose to be just like them. In an age where social media influencer is an entry into the cultural lexicon, do I have to argue this point? Ask any little boy, and I speak as one who once was a little boy, any little boy who has a sports hero, or maybe just his dad, whom he really loves, ask him. I mean, I have a series of personal illustrations from my past, and you do too, I'm sure. I remember seeing Bruce Lee and the Green Hornet on TV in the mid-60s. <sighs> he was so cool. I took my mother's black gloves and put them on my hands, and seven years old, I'm fighting the, the sofa pillows in the basement, just like Bruce Lee was doing with his Kung Fu. I loved Thurman Munson, the catcher for the New York Yankees. And when I heard that he was killed in a plane crash, I still remember where I was and what I was doing. I just sat there stunned when he died. I, I loved everything about him. I loved Frank Serpico. The, the New York policeman who gave evidence to the Knapp Commission to expo expose police corruption. And I loved Al Pacino's portrayal of him. So one reason I have an earring, or used to. John Lennon was a phase. But more than anyone else, it was George Harrison. Not Beatle George Harrison, post Beatle George Harrison. I was standing with some friends. We had the album, A Concert for Bangladesh, looking at the rehearsal photos. And I saw this man there, he was wearing like tan corduroys, a dungaree shirt and a brown vest, had hair down to here and a beard, and I, I was in love. A manly love, but I was in love. And I bought clothes that resembled his. I wanted to be a spiritual person, like he was which was and remains a very rare thing in pop culture. I loved his music. I had someone even made a little thing for me. I think I still have it, made on dungaree material. Um, George Harrison lookalike contest, place photo here. That was to be for my photo. And when he died in 2001, I got a call from a high school friend who I hadn't heard from since high school who wanted to pass on his condolences because he thought of me. So you, you get the idea, right? This is a very natural, spontaneous desire to imitate. We just do it. And it followed me into my Christian life. I can look back on my earlier years as a minister and I can identify my Martin Lloyd-Jones phase. Oh yeah, that's when I was reading Martin Lloyd-Jones and listening to his sermons. I can certainly, clearly, sometimes with a wince, identify my Jonathan Edwards phase. It seemed like every sermon had something Edwardsy about it, which was fine to a degree. But as I, if I ever look back, go, did I have to say that again? Imitation. It's uncoerced because it is deeply human. It is a deeply human way to express our love, right? We even say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And that's a very worldly thing to say, but it touches on something that is genuinely, authentically human. So what is natural to us 
in our fallen way of expressing, that is, imitation, is now redeemed and sanctified by Christ so that one of the great moral categories for Christianity is the imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ. The Christ, may I remind you, who is the image of the invisible God. The Christ whose image is being restored in his people corporately. And that is practically the very definition of Christian sanctification. And our corporate failure to obey this, this command with its undergirding requirement to be like Jesus, says a lot more about our own legal orientation in Christianity, where do and don't do are the ways we express the will of God, than it does about the new commandments, power and authority over us. And what I'm saying is basically, Jesus is speaking human language here. We imitate, we imitate. <laughs> And that brings me to my second point this morning. Those same words, as I have loved you, informs the epistle's moral instruction. Those words, as I have loved you, informs the epistle's moral instruction. I'm going to call the imitation commands soft commands. They are commands, but they are soft commands because when the apostles issue them, they tend to issue them in the tone, in the tone, the spirit of the new covenant's warm and familiar and fraternal love. So they are commands, but they are given in a way that almost slips past us if we're not paying attention, or if the only way we know how to hear the Word of God is to be given legal instruction. So, in effect, what I'm saying is, we're the problem. If we're going to find a communication fault we are so primed to hear moral instruction in the form of a legal requirement, maybe attended by a fireworks show, that when similar moral instruction is given by the apostles, undergirded by the imitation uh, foundation, we pay no attention to it, as if the apostles were giving good advice. They're not. I'm just going to read some passages. Romans 15, 1 through 7. Now listen to what Paul says, not with a legal orientation, but with a family orientation. Paul assumes that his readers are all in possession of something. The Holy Spirit, so that he can speak like he speaks without threatening, without cajoling, without nagging, like Moses nags. Have you ever just read through the law sections where Moses keeps repeating over and over again, but be careful, but make sure, but pay attention, but beware, lest you... It's like, okay, I get it. But they didn't get it. Now listen to Romans 15, 1 through 7. And listen to it in light of... John 13, 34 and 35, but really the whole event of the Last Supper and the crucifixion. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For, this is the ground of the command, for Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. 
For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another, just as Christ has welcomed you. Do you hear the comparative there? For the glory of God. Now this, of course, is for Reformed people, the boring section of Romans. The debate over election and predestination, we left that back in chapter 9, so now we're in the gooey stuff. But the gooey stuff has John 13, 34 through 35 commands in it, but soft commands. For Christ did not please himself. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. Does that sound more like the Decalogue or John 13? Not that I'm pitting those two against each other, but just ask yourselves that. Ephesians 4, 31 through 5, 2. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Kathos kai hatheos in Christu ekarisato humen. Just as also God in Christ forgave you. Just as also. Therefore be imitators of God. As beloved children, right? My illustration of saying fathers are role models for their children, hardly perfect ones, and some of them are absolute disasters. But this is natural to our humanity. I want to be like my dad. And maybe if you've had good fathers, you're like me. I'm 63 years old. No, not yet. <clears throat> 62 years old. But there are times when I think, what would my dad do? When I'm in the classroom, and this is true, I often think, what would T. David Gordon do? He was, he was the most natural teacher I've ever met. And he taught in person, in class, over the table, in the car, wherever. All in the context of friendship. It was remarkable left a mark on me so that when I'm in school, not like I don't wake up every day and say, what would T. David do? But that, I imitate him. Yeah, he's a little smarter than I am, but no, nah, you get the point. Okay, so that's what Paul, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. He speaks to us according to our new status and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Kathos kai ha Christos, egapisan hemos kai paradoken yutan huper hemon. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Sometimes I think these passages are like those dense passages in the prophets where if someone's reading to you, they just start becoming this, blah, 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 love, blah, 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 be nice, blah, blah, blah. These are all commands. Soft commands, maybe, but no less commands. Here's the classic one. Husbands, love your wives by keeping the seventh commandment. That's it? Well, of course that's not it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Kathos kai ha Christos egepesan tain ekklesion. I keep saying it that way to get those kathos kai ha Christos, just as Christ, and gave himself up for her. This command would not have made sense to an Israelite under the Old Covenant. Because the command 
is rooted and grounded in the doctrine of our union with the risen Christ. It's the only way it makes sense. So you can go back and say, keep the seventh commandment. How many of you wives would be satisfied with a husband who just kept the seventh commandment? Isn't this leagues away? Isn't this new covenant away from what's written in stone at Mount Sinai? Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Put this on. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, how do you solve it? Well, one way to solve it is forgiving each other. As the, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So did you hear John 13, 34 through 35 in these passages? They have a, a love command or the equivalent. The love is for other believers, not for a random set of prisoners who may not be believers, but are good for a photo op. And that repeated phrase, kathos kai ha Christos, just as also Christ. And because of time limitations, I haven't even touched those passages where Paul, he ups the ante. And he starts to say things like this. I want you to think like Jesus thought. It's no longer just a matter of imitation. It's a matter of taking on a different mindset, not anybody's mindset, but Christ's mindset. But that's a soft command. It doesn't grab us by the lapels like a good divine command should and shake us until we're ready to obey it. <laughs> Poor Paul. It's no wonder Cecil B. DeMille didn't make the movie The Epistles of Paul. And if Paul had known how much the church would ignore him outright so that it could pay more attention to Moses where the real action was, I guess maybe he would have hurled lightning bolts and shouted at us to do what I say. But that was his mistake. And if church history and the modern church at large are any indication, Paul seemed to put way, way too much trust in Jesus' command, in Jesus' example, and in the Holy Spirit, who he says elsewhere is Jesus Christ living in and through us. Talk about imitation. Well, it is easy to focus on the failures. I hope we're all aware of our own, and we no doubt have our own horror stories to tell about where Christian people just really blew off this command in favor of preserving their own rights and privileges. D.A. Carson said in his commentary, the new command is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate. Profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. I thought that was an, uh, an especially useful insight. So with that in mind, I want to close with a good memory. And because I'm the, the preacher, I get the illustrations. So it's my memory. It's a cherished mem memory of a time in my life when I lived in a Christian community that lived out, it seemed, Jesus commandment on a daily basis. When I entered it, Youth with a Mission, back in 1980, I, was, I wasn't a baby Christian, I was an infant Christian. 
when I became a part of it, covered with my own metaphorical warts. I mean, when I went to visit for the first time, remember the George Harrison thing? My hair was down to here, earring and all kinds. And this was 1980. People, that, that distinguished you in the culture. So jewelry and necklaces and earrings and long hair. And I thought they're going to look at me and say, thank you, brother, but you probably need a few years under your belt. Nope. I was loved and accepted and valued for who I was from the leadership down. Do you know what that created? Something that you do not find in typical churches. Trust. Trust. I could trust people. It was also, I say this sincerely, the healthiest soil for my earliest experience as a disciple. I even had girl friends, not girlfriends, though I did, I ended up with one. <laughs> friends who were girls, really women, married women, single women, we're just friends. We were, we were close, just like brothers and sisters are close. And of course there was Marcia. Now much of the doctrine that I learned there was solid enough at least to establish and build up what we would call a consistent devotional life and a sense of calling and mission. There were other things that I had to unlearn when I went to school and when I became a brainiac. I even felt a little resentful, as young men do when they learn new things. They are smarter and wiser than everybody else. And I probably suffered from that disease myself. But I want to close with a, just a little taste of that love. One of the women, this is, goes back now 40 plus years. She's a very, very good friend of mine and is to this day. And she is suffering from a serious kidney disease. A rapidly declining serious kidney disease. And 40 years later, 40 years plus, there, were, there are two men now who were in that original relatively small group of Christians, both of whom are, one is 70, I think, and one must be mid-60s, have happily stepped forward to donate a kidney to her. And that seems to me to be what Tertullian meant when he said, see how they love one another. There is something that they could see. You can't see love, but you can see love in action. And that's what Tertullian meant. Blessed are you if you know these things and you do them. We'll pray. And then when I conclude the pastoral prayer, We'll pray congregationally the Monday Thursday collect from the Book of Common Prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we have Israel as an example. Israel's story was written for us so that we might learn and one thing that we might learn is how selective they were in the way they obeyed you. They obeyed what they wanted to obey, and they overlooked what they didn't want to obey. And perhaps that explains our modern dilemma as well. It's as if there is a canon within a canon, commands that grab hold of us and our passions and affections and others that roll off of us like water from a duck's back and they leave no mark or impression. And we have to ask your forgiveness for our selective reading and hearing if we have fallen short in this way. But we can also turn to you with hope and a renewed confidence in your Holy Spirit 
so that you might work in our midst that which is pleasing in your sight, to create the love that outsiders may see and trace back to our Lord Jesus Christ, whose love we actively imitate. Bless us with this, for it is a place of confidence and trust and safety, as the Church of God should be. And now as we turn to the Lord's table, we find there in action what was revealed in words, a kind of love that the world had not seen before, the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the new standard of love by which we measure all loves. Grant us insight into this love and break our hearts for the ways that we fall short, even as we receive reassurances that you are for us and that in Christ Jesus you have saved us. Bless us there, we pray, even now as we pray together. Almighty Father, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, did institute the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may thankfully receive the same in remembrance of him, who in these holy mysteries gives us pledge of life eternal, the same your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> the only thing necessary to obey the new commandment is Jesus present in you by the Holy Spirit. That's what I appreciated in that quote from D.A. Carson. A toddler can memorize those words and appreciate them at his or her own level. But if you think about it, you don't even have to be literate to keep the commandment, do you? Not if you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a sacrifice in order to pay your debt, there you have his example in what he has done for you. And in that respect, you don't have to be literate to understand what's happening every time we come to the Lord's table, where that action of love is reoccurring, reproduced in symbolic form, week by week. So there is no necessary period of preparation and education for obedience. It is simply being a Christian, seeing Jesus with the eyes of faith, and being filled with his Holy Spirit. And so, as I mentioned previously, even as the sacrament of the Lord's Supper impresses deeply upon us the love that sent Jesus to the cross to take us back for God. So in its own way, it's a soft command. And it says, now go and you do likewise. A sacrament is a means of grace. So perhaps in that respect, Everything is necessary, even the grace to obey, because it's represented for us here in the body and the blood of Jesus. If you are not a Christian this morning, then I'm going to urge you not to come to the Lord's table, but to think about what it means to genuinely trust in Christ and receive from him the forgiveness of sins and the pledge of everlasting life. You may talk to me or to one of the elders, but don't participate in the Lord's Supper. But to all the rest who call upon Jesus as the Lord with sincere hearts, the Lord speaks to you in this supper, and he speaks softly 
and gently and lovingly when he offers you his body and his blood.